are foods that are produced by 10 largest food companies in the world that now control over 70% of the food system. And they basically tell farmers and producers what to grow, what to make, and what price they're willing to pay. It created a system of basically indentured servants all over the world. So the fact that vegan processed foods are partaking, are continuing the evolution of these highly commodified crops and participating in the corporate food system of making these packaged foods, the economics of food into the hands of a handful of corporations. And at the end of the day, more animals will suffer. Um, and the entire industrialized food system that has led to the creation of processed packaged foods is destroying uh, not only personal health, but the planet and, and communities the world over. Vegan companies, vegan foods are not innocent. They are also participating in the same sickness creating system. He's a best-selling author, award-winning filmmaker, inspirational speaker, certified nutrition coach, plant-powered athlete, and host of the number one holistic health podcast in the world, Nathan Crane. Hey, what's happening? Welcome to the podcast. I'm Nathan Crane. I'm excited that you're joining me for this inspiring conversation today. And before we dive in, I want to give you a free five-day challenge I've put together to help you get fit, healthy, and feeling great. It's a plant-powered athlete five-day challenge to help you incorporate more healthy plant-powered nutrition into your diet to help you improve your performance in and out of the gym. You can get the recipes, guidebook, and all the details for free over at plantpoweredathlete.com. If you're ready to take your performance to the next level, head over to plantpoweredathlete.com. Sign up today for your free five-day plant-powered athlete challenge. All right. Let's get into this episode. Miyoko Shinner is an award-winning chef, author, entrepreneur, speaker. She founded Miyoko's Creamery and is the author of six cookbooks, including the best-selling homemade vegan pantry. And she currently hosts a new YouTube cooking channel called The Vegan Good Life with Miyoko. Um, and you were featured in that uh, Netflix series. I think a bunch of people have seen by now. You Are What You Eat, which is the twin experiment. Um, yes. I want to talk about that. I want to talk about your career. By the way, what box do you train at? Uh, I'm here in Jacksonville, Florida. And so oh, okay. I kind of bounce around between there, my home gym and LA Fitness. And so just kind of like bounce, bounce around between mm -hmm. them right now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You're in, where are you? You're in Marin? You're in California? I'm in Marin. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. I, I, I did CrossFit like years ago when I turned 50. Like right when cross, like the only, there were only like a couple of boxes at the time that was in, that was more than 16 years ago. Oh, wow. So you still um, doing CrossFit now or no? No, I mean, I do CrossFit like workouts. I have a home gym. So, you know, like I'll do like a, a really modified um, Fran or, you know, whatever. Like I'll just wait, I cut, I've cut way back, you know, I'm 66 and a half and, and. Um, you look great for six, six and a half. Like, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I just like, I just get injured all the time. Like, I don't know, like I was doing back squats, um, a couple of weeks ago and I finally had worked back up to a hundred pounds. Doesn't sound like a lot, but, um, and then, so I thought, Oh, I'll do 110. And then I pulled a muscle. Mm. So it's like, I just, you know, I don't know. I feel like, um, my body is just not what it used to be. So anyway. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I can imagine. I mean, we've we had um, at my CrossFit gym in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I started. Uh, we had a woman there who was, I think, she was seventy, close to seventy, and she she started because she loved to sell, and she had a sailboat, and she just she couldn't sell anymore. She had gotten too weak, too frail, and she just literally couldn't do it anymore. She heard about CrossFit. She started getting kind of some one-on-one -on -one training yeah. and then started, she worked her way up to be able to do the classes. And mm -hmm. you know, that's the cool thing about CrossFit is you can scale yeah. everything. If you've got good right. coaches, if you have good coaches, yes. CrossFit's yes. amazing for everybody. If you don't have great coaches, then you know, it can be challenging because if you're someone like me and I don't know about you, but, or if you're like type a person, it's like, you want to go hard all the time, heavy, yeah. you know, do your best. And as you're aging, as you know, that's not always ideal. 
Um, right. and, yeah. and, and, or like you can overdo it. You can go too heavy, too fast or not have right. like my issues early on was I didn't have good range of motion. I had poor flexibility, right. you know, and then, yeah, all that stuff leads to injury. So it's like, if you have good coaches, so this woman, we had great coaches there, um, older population. So they're really used to working with people as they age. And so, I mean, she'd been doing it for two or three years and was able to sell again, you know, got her fitness back, her strength back, her health back. And she was just like on cloud nine, you know? Yeah, no, yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it's really a great workout and I just have to modify it and scale it back. hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I have to right now too, because I'm dealing with a couple of injuries from, from overtraining, you know, I've been training yeah. to be a competitive athlete and just right. pushing too far too too hard, too long push through injuries instead of backing off and like letting them rest. I'm like, Oh, it's just pain. It'll go away. And then two or three months later, it's like, no, nope, it hasn't gone away. It's actually gotten worse. And so now I've had right. to back way off and yeah, I'm scaling everything right now too. But, um, yeah. you know, hopefully we, we live and learn, right. <laughs> right. Also, you know, you've been vegan for like 30 something years, right? Oh, since the mid 1980s. So I think it's coming on 40 years. What? Yeah, it's been time. what is it's a long time. What has been the hardest part of being vegan for you? Oh, the hardest part, I think, uh, has been trying to figure out the best form of activism. Mm. Um, I think um, I have wavered between not really talking about why vegan to um, going overboard and just sort of getting on my uh, soapbox. Um, and really just trying to find that balance and figure out what is effective out, uh, activism. What is what communicates pe to people that this is a great lifestyle? What is inspirational? How can I inspire people to be better versions of themselves? And that has taken a long time to figure out. Have you figured it out? <laughs> you know, that may be a lifelong uh, search. However, I feel like I've gotten a lot better. And I have figured out that uh, you can't scream at people. You can't shame them. You can't scare them. You don't, have throw, to don't throw blood on them. You know, that's just, right. right. That's yeah. right. It doesn't work. You have to inspire them. You have yeah. to give them hope. You have to encourage them. Let them know that they too can be better versions of themselves. They can be happier. They can be stronger. Uh, everything that they thought about is possible. And, and you have to do it in a way that is loving and caring and shows compassion. And if you can do that with great food over a table while breaking bread, having great conversation, um, I think you can touch people in ways that can transform their lives. Have you heard of PEMF therapy for cancer? Well, this podcast is brought to you by Dr. Pollock, and he wants to share with you the groundbreaking research of pulsed electromagnetic field therapy in the treatment of cancer. Studies show PMF therapy can help control the cancer process and give safe, non-toxic, and non-invasive symptom management. PMF therapy may enhance other cancer support and treatments, lower inflammation, and promote tissue healing. Studies show it's possible to improve your general well-being and recuperate from surgery, radiation, and chemo better and more quickly. Embrace a comprehensive approach to cancer treatment with PMF therapy, a vital tool on your path to prevention, treatment, and recovery. For caring and professional guidance and recommendations from Dr. Pollock, go to drpollock.com forward slash intro to cancer. That's drpawluk.com forward slash intro to cancer. This podcast is brought to you by Econugenics, the makers of Pectisol modified citrus pectin. Pectisol is clinically proven and backed by over 80 studies, six patents, and 30 plus years of clinical success. We're all familiar with inflammation and chronic diseases like cancer, but have you ever wondered where these health issues actually come from? You need to read more about an inflammatory protein called Galactin-3. It's been called by thousands of practitioners and research papers one of the root causes of nearly every chronic illness. Pectisol modified citrus pectin is the most researched Galactin-3 blocker on the market. It's been recommended by thousands of doctors for over 30 years to support oncology, immune health, and gentle detoxification. I personally use Pectisol, and I highly recommend it. Start your journey toward a healthier you with Pectisol Modified Citrus Pectin, and Econugenics is offering our listeners 15% off at econugenics.link forward slash ncrane15. 
15. You'll be able to use NCRANE15 as a discount code to get 15% off your order. Again, that's econugenics.link forward slash NCRANE15. You know, with the cold and flu season here, it's critically important that we enhance and strengthen our immune systems. Yes, would you agree? The problem is, though, that there's so much confusion out there when it comes to what actually works for our bodies and for our health. Well, I'll tell you what I used. I used Maison Beljansky's wellness products. Maison Beljansky's products are backed by science to not only help empower the immune system, but can support detoxification and contribute to our overall health. Coming from Europe, the all natural Beljansky formulas are now available in the United States and are recommended by top doctors everywhere. A lot of the colleagues I work with, functional medicine practitioners that work with patients with all kinds of diseases, are recommending Maison Beljansky's products to their very own patients. As a special sponsor of this podcast, Maison Beljansky has included a very special discount offer for all of my listeners. You can get 15% off your first order using the promo code Nathan. And you'll always enjoy free shipping when you order four products or more. You can grab your wellness products today at MaisonBeljansky.com. That's M-A-I-S-O-N-B-E-L-J-A-N-S-K-I. MaisonBeljansky.com. And use code Nathan for 15% off. Hey, so if you've been following me for any time now, you know that I often talk about Helin 951, the nitrogen fermented organic soy drink. I first learned about it at an integrative cancer event years ago, and I've been taking this myself for a long time. It's so potent and it has a strong flavor. So I add their organic mint powder to it and it's easy to take any time of day. I usually take it in the mornings. You know, I'm constantly looking into natural health products and the ones that catch my eye are the ones with years of proven results and the science and research to back them up. I love that Helin 951 checks all of these boxes. Made from a unique 100% organic soybean grown in the high mountains of Mongolia, Helin 951 has some incredible health properties. Just a few of the benefits are more energy, better sleep, detox, longevity, better immune function, and some fantastic anti-cancer compounds. The folks over at Helin have made a page just for our followers to learn more. You can head over to helin951.com forward slash crane. That's H-A-E-L-A-N. 951.com forward slash crane. They have special discounted packages there for you to get you started. And if you use the promo code crane, C R A N E, at checkout, they will also give you free shipping. So head over and grab this special offer for yourself and use the free shipping promo code crane, or just give them a call if that's easier for you. They are so easy to work with and have over 32 years in the industry. Again, that's helin951.com forward slash crane. So are you someone who believes every single person needs to be vegan no matter what? Or are you more open to freedom of choice? People can choose whatever they want. Uh, you encourage people to be vegan for the various reasons that I'd love for you to share. But at the end of the day, it's up to them and you're not here to tell them what to do. Like, where do you stand on that end of the spectrum? Well, I'm definitely not here to tell them what to do. But, and, and I also think it has to do with where you live on the planet. Uh, and where you are in your life, you may not have a choice to be vegan. You know, you may be in a, in a life situation where you're depending on food that's provided to you and you don't have a say, but if you do have a choice, then I do encourage you to explore this way of living. Um, it's not just a diet. It really is a way of living that is based on compassion and under, and respect for all living beings, both human and non-human. Um, but many people in the world don't have that ability. They're not in a place, they're not in a position to choose what they eat. And I can't pass judgment on them. What do you say for people who believe that God put animals here for humans as food? I'm Well, I read the Bible and I don't know where it says that anywhere. Um, it does, I mean, say, it does word... say though, um, it does say, you know, um, don't eat uh, cloven hooved animals, but you can eat other types of animals. I don't remember it word for word, but, but there is, it is in the Bible about 
um, don't eat these animals, but you can eat these animals basically. And it's like the cloven hooved ones don't eat, yeah. but you know, Jesus gave, you know, uh, um, fish to, you know, and, and so obviously there, there's argument of, well, a lot of the Bible is, um, metaphorical, right? Um, <laughs> and so how do you differentiate between what's metaphorical and what's literal? Um, that's, that's, that's an interesting conversation I love to have with people because, it even says yeah. right in the Bible that Jesus teaches in parables so that people may understand him, which parables are basically stories or metaphors. And so I think a challenge is when you take everything literal in these ancient texts like the Bible um, mm -hmm. or even or even the um, Bhagavad Gita, for example, which is basically a story of metaphors. Um, you know, if you take things absolutely literal, then are you missing what was actually being said? And so that's a challenge, but, but yeah, it does say in the Bible, you know, you can eat meat. Um, but well, I mean, I, I think that could be argued as well too. I mean, there are lots of words in the Bible that we've read in the King James edition in a certain translation. And, um, you know, we may not actually have a true translation of certain Hebrew or Greek words. Um, for example, the word dominion over animals, apparently, that word is tr at the time that it was written actually meant more like stewardship. Mm. So, uh, you know, we, it was our responsibility to take care of animals, not do whatever we want with them. Um, and, it, you know, it can also be debated. Um, there's the, uh, the scene uh, where Christ goes into um, the temple and uh, uh, rails against the money uh, changers and knocks over tables and apparently they had a lot to do with animal sacrifices and selling of body parts um and so there's a lot that i think could be argued about whether or not you know where the bible really stands <laughs> on it um so um it, you know it's complicated it is complicated i think it's i think it's an interesting um question as well and because if you look at the timeline right in in genesis before um before noah's ark before that story happens before the great flood so in genesis right. I, I pulled up so people want to look it up 129 to 130 it says then god said i've given you every sort of seed bearing plant on earth and every kind of fruit bearing tree given them to you for food to right. all exactly. animals and all birds everything that moves and breathes i give whatever grows out of the ground for food so, so that's, we were all that's herbivores at one point. Potentially, right? And so that's, I mean, if if you believe, you know, the story of the Bible, it's basically saying in Genesis, in the beginning, yeah, you know, the paradise on earth is everything, everybody's eating plants and not eating animals. And then the flood happens, yeah. Noah's Ark, the animals, he saves them two by two, etc. And then that that passage comes where he says you can eat certain animals and not other animals. Uh, or the Bible says that anyway. And so what's interesting about that timeline, if you were thinking through it kind of logically, it's like, well, okay, if there was a great flood and you no longer had access to any plants to eat because it wiped all of it out, what would you eat? Well, you had some animals. So he right. said, okay, you can eat these animals so you don't die. Right. Mm -hmm. But the paradise in the beginning, it's it's plants. So it's almost like, well, now if we were going back to that paradise time, do we need to kill animals, to eat them. And would God, exactly. would God want us to, you know, that's a, that's an interesting religious well, philosophical question that exactly. I have. Exactly. I mean, I think we have to always reflect upon our point in time. Where are we uh, in place and time and determine what choices do we actually have? And then we have to make whatever best choices we're presented with. And those choices can depend on our situation in life and where we are historically, as well as in place. Um, but I think those of us in the Western world have a lot of options. And so we have to choose wisely. So when, when, what do you say to people who don't recognize that, you know, animals shouldn't be food for them who basically say, well, you know, they're here for us to eat. We need meat to survive, et cetera, et cetera but you're more on the compassionate side, you're animal rights activist. Why, why do you have that stance? What has driven you to that? Well, it, let's go back to the Bible for a minute. The, the Greek word that's used for love in the New Testament is agape. 
Um, and there's several different words for, there's philos, agape, uh, eros, these are all Greek words for love, and they represent different types of love. But the word that's used for love in the Bible, agape, actually means compassion. It means having a, a type of love that is all encompassing uh, towards others, towards other beings. And it's all been translated into this simplified English word, love. And so we don't distinguish between the love between a man and a woman or uh, for your children or, or whatever. Um, so I think we need to keep that in mind uh, in terms of figuring out how can we become our best selves. Now, when I talk to someone who says, well, I'm not going to give up meat, I'm a hardcore meat eater, I don't usually get into these conversations with them. Um, Normally, the, the omnivores at my table are delighted to eat whatever it is I put in front of them. And I try to create community events. I live in, to be honest, I live in uh, ag land. I live in a land in, in, a, in the countryside surrounded by dairy farms and, and cattle ranches and pig farmers and so on. Um, and uh, I have a lot of friends in the community. And I've had ranchers sit at my table. I actually did a vegan cooking class last summer. And I had three ranchers show up and the, they were all telling me they just want to learn how to eat that tastier vegetables. They just, mm. they all realize that they need to reduce their meat intake, even if they're in the business of selling meat. I've even had a rancher tell me that the hardest day for her is when the transport truck comes to haul her animals away. And so, you know, ranchers are also people with feelings. Um, they also are oftentimes very, very conflicted, but it's how they make their living. And so showing compassion towards them, sharing food, sharing possibilities, just opening up their minds to um, different ways they can prepare food. Um, this is an act of activism for me, um, being a good member of the community, being friends with them, showing them that I care about them, that 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 we're all in this community together. Um, and... I think the biggest form of act, the most effective form of activism is building community and, and showing that you are a supporter of that. One of the hardest things for me to, to grasp my mind around, because I agree, I think if, if we want to be compassionate, spiritually evolved human beings, and, and in my mind, uh, and if you look at every ancient philosophical and religious text, you know, being spiritually advanced, spiritually elevated, evolved is about being compassionate, loving, understanding, um, elevating ourselves emotionally, ex experiencing and, and embracing and exuding more love, forgiveness, compassion. The one of the really big challenges for me to to understand, because to understand somebody, you have to put yourself in their shoes and try to understand their thinking, what they're going through, right, is this idea of humane killing or humane slaughtering like it, it's tough for me to understand that someone can justify okay we raise these animals we take good care of them and then we humanely kill them i don't think i mean of course you could torture an animal or torture someone and that wouldn't be humane but i don't see i think there's a logical fallacy there in that killing something or someone is not there's no humanity in that there there's no way to do that humanely just because you put a bullet through their head or slit their throat you know i'm not, it's just hard for me to to grasp that concept that there's such a thing how do you look at that no i'm with you 100 percent um and, and and that is a point that uh where i differ with some of my uh, neighbors i mean i've actually had this exact same conversation with ranchers who said you know, we take care of all of our animals. They are given the best life possible and um, they have one bad day. Um, I've, you know, I've had, and that's where we're going to part ways, but that's not going to stop me from breaking bread with them. That's not going to stop me from inviting them to my table and sharing great vegan food. And, um, you know, I have friends that argued with me for 20, 30 years. And then one day they came to me and they said, I finally get it. I'm vegan now. So, you know, they could be the most hardcore rancher who um, still continues to send their animals away on that transport truck. But I see it, you know, I see it, I see their hearts opening up a little at a time, just like that woman, I, that female rancher I told you about who says every single year she cries when her animals are taken away. But that's her livelihood. She has no other way to make a living. And she was, you know, 65 or so at the time. And 
point. She said, I don't know what else I would do. Um, and so I don't think she owns her land. I think she leases it. So we do have to have compassion and people are on their own journeys. And no, there is no such thing as humane slaughter. At the end of the day, you're killing an animal for your own enjoyment because it's not for your survival. You absolutely do not need to kill an animal to survive anymore. Um, you know, maybe if you live, I don't know, if you were in some, you were in the Amazon or something like that and you didn't know what plants to eat. I don't know. But I mean, unless there's an extreme situation, it's just not necessary anymore. But I'm still not going to um, unfriend these people. Right. Because I need to feel, I need to continue being their friend if I'm ever going to have a chance to get through. I love that. I mean, how can you be friends with, with animals and care about animals, but not fellow humans and, and people that we don't agree with, right? It's like, you don't agree with everything an animal does, but you're still going to have love and compassion for them. You may not agree with everything that your neighbors do, but it's still a great practice to have love and compassion for them. No matter what we differ on beliefs. I think this is, you know, the beauty of our modern day and, and one of the benefits, I mean, there's definitely some detriments to the internet and social media, but one of the benefits to it is that we actually get to see dissenting opinions and viewpoints and share ideas and, and see what other people are thinking and have those conversations because we need to, I mean, if we're going to grow as individuals and grow as a society, um, as a human population around the planet, we have to be open to seeing other people's viewpoints and ideas and not, you know, the, the detriment to social media is what happens is like people disagree with you and they vehemently attack you and call you names and all this stuff that they would never say to your face. First of all, they would never, you would never meet somebody in person and they'd be like, Oh, you're a piece of shit and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, Whoa, 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 buddy. Like no one would ever do that, you know? Um, but, for whatever reason, you hide behind the veil of your social media account and people's garbage just gets spewed out. And, and I, you know, I, I've seen myself doing it. I've seen someone post something. I'm like, that is so stupid. What are you ever saying? And then I have to catch myself and be like, hang on a second. What are you doing? Like, this is not going to help anybody or anything. So I've certainly been guilty of it, but I manage it, you know, pretty yeah. well. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But we have to be open to different viewpoints, right? And that's why, um, I have been extensively following, you know, the carnivore movement because I'm trying to understand these doctors and people, why they're saying what they're saying. At first I was like, these guys are idiots. They don't know what they're talking about. And the more I've followed it the last few years, like the more I really understand. I mean, mm -hmm. these are people coming to these doctors with IBS, with chronic diseases, with, you know, irritable bowel, with Crohn's disease and, and they get on an all meat diet and all their symptoms go away. Their disease goes away. They feel amazing. They have energy, you know, on a carnivore diet. And they say carnivore diet is the way it saved my life, saved my health. And there's not, it's not a one-off case. There's thousands and thousands of cases. So from a health perspective, people are seeing results in the short term. Nobody knows what's going to happen long-term with that. We have no studies, no long-term. I can't say long-term they're all going to have heart disease and die. Nobody can, no doctor, no scientist. I believe that's probably what's going to happen. A lot of us believe that's probably what's going to happen. But there's no carnivore expert doctor who say, yeah, you can be on this all meat diet for 40 years. You're going to be fine. You're going to be great and healthy. There's nobody that can say you're going to be on this 40 years and you're, everyone's going to end up with heart disease and cancer and die either. We don't have those studies. But um, at the end of the day, that's what people are being led to believe. You know, they're being led to believe Oh, well, this, this healed my digestive issues or my symptoms or my autoimmune disease or whatever. So this is a diet I should be on for the rest of my life. And I got into, well, you know, the, the, go ahead. No, 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 no. I mean, you got that CrossFit t-shirt on. And when I was doing CrossFit back, you know, 10, 15 years ago, um, everybody was getting on the paleo diet. Um, and people were telling me that I was going to be really, really sick that I wasn't going to be able to do CrossFit because I was a vegan. Um, I think, you know, I don't think I followed the carnivore diet <laughs> like you have, but I will say that if you just look at the longest lived societies in the world, they're not carnivorous societies. Right. They eat very little meat. Um, and so we often uh, forget when we live here in the United States or maybe in Europe, we tend to focus on what we're doing 
in our society as the only way to do it. And we forget that historically, for most of most in most parts of the world, we ate mainly a plant-based diet and everywhere. I mean, we just didn't have access to meat. Like we people talk about hunter gatherers. I mean, that's sort of a it's sort of been uh, debunked. I mean, we were more gatherers than we were hunters because we just couldn't catch that many animals. And, and, you know, we didn't have refrigeration. There were so many other reasons as to why you just couldn't eat meat on a daily basis. Um, so there are very few societies that did. And if you just look at the longest lived societies today, the blue zones or, or, or many other parts of the world, the ones that live the longest do not eat a lot of meat. They eat mostly legumes and vegetables and gr whole grains. Um, and so I don't think maybe, I mean, I think it's odd that somebody should feel great from eating meat for a short time. Um, but I imagine that I don't think that I don't think their longevity is going to, uh, I don't think there'll be much longevity to maintaining it. Yeah. I mean, it, time will tell. I mean, we've got people that are six, seven years into it and doing great and amazing. Their LDL cholesterol is super high, but there's, you know, this, this theory now that high LDL only matters in a insulin resistant environment. And, and there's actually some weight to that theory, but again, we have no hard evidence, no long-term studies. As you said, all the long-term data and studies okay. point to more plant food in your diet, more real foods, more organic foods, of course, less processed foods, overall is going to lead to a longer, healthier life. Um, okay, and, but I'm going to add, yeah, okay, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was and. just going to say, and, and because I got into, you know, plant-based, you know, veganism, vegetarianism through the health component first uh, in 2010. And then, you know, and, and my, my main focus has been health and health research, but over time, pretty quickly within the first one or two years, um, definitely uh, connected with, um, compassion for animals and sustainability of the planet. So like that's been a big part of my life the last 13 years, um, but have been very heavily focused on the health and health research part for, you know, the last 13 plus years. And so the health side is really fascinating to me because what we thought was true, even in the plant-based community, um, what I'm finding out, there's a lot of holes in it. And so I think people have to be careful. You know, I'm finding every day, it's like, that's what I'm saying. We have to be open-minded to all of it because, you know, science is rapidly evolving and there's no science that's ever set in stone. And that's super mm -hmm. important, not for carnivore, not for omnivore, not for vegan, right? There's no mm -hmm. hardcore science that's set in stone. This is the only way it is. But to your point, if we look at people living in the blue zones, now we know, you know, not all of them were, were plant-based. We know none of them were actually vegan. Um, no, many of them were veg minimal. vegetarian, yeah, vegetarian or, or, min you know, a little bit of fish, you know, Mediterranean diet's a great right. example, right? Right. Um, Sardinia, Italy, I mean, eat a little bit of fish and maybe a little bit of lamb, but most people, so my friend, Jason Prawl, um, founder of the human longevity project went to the blue zones and filmed his own documentary series there years ago. And he told me, he said, you know, I ne we never met anybody vegan, but we met most people vegetarian or or strong whole food plant-based diet right. with a little bit of meat they they drank some of their own milk from their own sheep they ate some eggs from their own chickens things like that um but predominantly plants and the older they were he met more and more and he's not even vegan vegetarian he has no he has no you know fight in the game or um you know stake in the game for example it's like he would just want to go find out the truth mm -hmm. and so i find his what he shared to be, you know, very um, reliable. And the difference there too, though, is the community aspect, the relationships, the spiritual aspect, the time that outdoors. Is also incredibly important. Yeah, yeah. And, and, the clo and I would say the closeness to nature, the closeness mm -hmm. to nature, and the closeness to their animals, whether they ate them yeah. or not, the closeness to right. them, the local aspect of it, the organic, you know, all of that makes such a huge difference. In uh, I mean, the animals aren't in some factory farm in the central Valley, you know, unseen from the public eye and all of that. So, I mean, all, it, it all adds up. There is no way to just isolate diet and say that diet alone is enough because it's not, you know, you can eat the healthiest diet and you could be uh, living all by your lonesome without a community 
And you could get cancer from that, you know, just because you're depressed and stressed out at all. Uh, so I don't think that you can, you can isolate any one of these community uh, exercise diet and say that one thing alone will give you longevity. But, you know, I want to add a little bit about like, um, there is an obsession in this country with personal health. Um, and in many parts of the world, you don't have a luxury of focusing on your own individual health because you're trying to make a living or support your family or uh, just get enough food on the table. Um, and at the same time that we're just, uh, we're obsessed with our personal health, we're destroying the planet and um, we're killing animals. Um, and the question, it begs the question, how healthy can we truly be if the planet's not healthy? If we're, if animals aren't healthy, um, if the way we're living is destroying the planet. Um, and now we've got, you know, microplastics everywhere and, um, and um, there's, I don't know, uh, antibiotics being used on every single animal and, and, you know, animal suffering is contributing to the demise of the planet, et cetera. How, how what does it matter how healthy we are as an individual mm. and can we even be that healthy uh, in an unhealthy ecosystem? Um, and so I think at some point we have to overcome our obsession with personal health and realize that personal health is tied to global health, to ecosystem health, to the health of the community. And without everything working in, in tandem, um, you know, we can't really say, hey, I'm really, really healthy. That's a good point. I mean, it's a fishbowl analogy. You know, if you had a sick fish, you don't try to treat the fish. If the fish was getting sick from dirty water that it's living in, you know, you change the water, right? You don't try to treat the fish. It's like, oh, it's in dirty, polluted water. Let's get clean water in there. And that's, you know, the world is our fishbowl. And yes, we are polluting it extensively. And I guess that leads to a problem I have with veganism in, in some aspects where we tout veganism as the end-all, cure-all, be-all solution for sustainability, for health, for, you know, compassion, et cetera, when in fact... There are aspects of veganism that are completely destroying the planet, that are completely destroying people's health, that are leading to chronic diseases, that are causing tremendous amount of pollution. Um, and so, you know, when we, and I used to be, you know, more of a zealot of like, oh yeah, veganism is the way for everybody, for the whole planet, for everything. And then as I've kind of woken up to the realities over the years, it's like, well, no, there are very, very dark sides to veganism that we need to be aware of. And it's not, the end all be all for for every solution um and that's my perspective my perspective is because you can go vegan and live on a junk food diet which is what many many people do and if you look at most of studies showing vegan deficiencies and vegan bone health density decreasing and um, vegan health problems every single one of those studies that i've seen is people on primarily a a junk food vegan diet it's processed food it's ultra processed it's doritos it's it's crap food it's you know oreos yeah, this uh, kind of stuff the impossible burgers etc you know and uh, nathan i'm on uh, the same page as you are um i think there's a tendency in the vegan community to think that as long as i'm saving animals that's all that matters uh, i don't care what i eat um and i say to these people you should care what you eat um and it's not just about your personal health um because what you eat impacts more than just animals. It impacts how people live in other parts of the world. For example, these processed foods that are that are uh, vegan. First of all, I want to just point out that they're kind of giving veganism a bad name. A lot of people go, oh, I would never go vegan because it's just full of junk food. And it's really true. That is what the marketplace today is full of. People don't associate veganism with eating whole beans and vegetables and, and sort of a fresh diet anymore. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, yeah, vegan, a vegan diet meant a fresh whole foods based diet that would, that would, uh, that was full of energy and would give you an abundant amount of, uh, I don't know, vivaciousness. But today people think, you know, I, I could never go vegan because I, I don't want to eat beyond. I don't like the taste of it. And I don't like 
the the list of ingredients I can't pronounce half. I mean, why do I want to put methyl cellulose into my body? Um, and so it's sort of given veganism a bad rap. Um, but at the same time, I will say that a lot of big, uh, processed food in general, whether it's vegan or not vegan, um, are foods that are produced by 10, the 10 largest food companies in the world that now control over 70% of the food system. And they basically tell farmers and producers what to grow, what to make, and what price they're willing to pay. And what that's done is it created a system of basically indentured ser servants all over the world. And we have, um, it started with the Green Revolution with Monsanto and GMO seeds. So GMO is not just about personal health. It is about more than soil health as well. It's about the health of communities because they went into places like India and they say, hey, we want you to grow these crops, these 10 crops for us. And these Indian farmers or farmers in um, the Southern hemisphere stopped growing, you know, the hundreds of varieties of of uh, crops that they were growing that were feeding their community. And they started growing a limited number of crops simply for these corporations. And we're talking like Nestle and Unilever and ConAgra. Um, and, you know, they were they started growing just a certain variety of potatoes, corn, wheat, soy that would go into these packaged products. Um, and what happened then was that they stopped being able to feed their communities. The, the rural communities started moving to the inner cities. These huge slums started. And they basically stopped feeding their communities and people and uh, poverty and starvation actually rose. It didn't diminish because of the so-called green revolution or modern agriculture. Modern agriculture has actually created more famine than, than existed previously. So the fact that vegan processed foods are partaking, are continuing the evolution of these highly commodified crops, these commodity crops, and participating in the corporate food system of uh, making these packaged foods. And if you're a startup, your hope is that you're gonna be acquired by one of these 10 big companies. We are co further consolidating the economics of food into the hands of a handful of corporations. Um, and as we continue to do so, uh, food sovereignty will decline, communities will uh, lose their ability to feed themselves. Um, and at the end of the day, more animals will suffer. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I hate to say it, but it's not so cut and dried as whether or not there's animals on your plate or there aren't animals on your plate. Um, it's much more nuanced, it's much more uh, connected overall. Um, and the entire industrialized food system that has led to the creation of processed packaged foods is destroying uh, not only the planet, but uh, not only personal health, but the planet and, and communities the world over. So we really do need a new way. And veganism, vegan companies, vegan foods are not innocent. They are also participating in the same sickness creating system and we need to find a better way we can do better as vegans you know um so we can start creating foods that are i don't know that create crop diversity that restore soil health that restore power back into the hands of small farmers the world over um so we can do better we need to do better i got on my soapbox for a minute <laughs> I agree. I, I, I completely agree. And I think that's that's part of the bigger conversation we need to have as a as a community of people who are interested in nutrition, in health, in sustainability, in animal welfare, whether you're vegan or not. You know, I have a company uh, we just launched called Plant Powered Athlete, and it's it's about educating and supporting um, and helping people who are athletes at any age of life to to improve their performance and health by incorporating more plant foods into their diet. And it's not about vegans and not, you know, vegetarians. It's about everybody. It's like, look, we know that if you eat more real food, more whole foods, more plant foods, more organic foods and add them into your diet strategically, it's going to help your health. It's going to help your performance. It's going to help the sustainability of the planet. Um, and let's go to the next level, right? Which is regenerative agriculture, uh, permaculture. Yes. I mean, that's really, to me, that's the way of the future. You have these conversations of 
people who say, okay, you're killing all these animals and eating them. It's inhumane. It is, you know, terrible thing that you're doing. And then animal based people say, well, yeah, but you guys are killing all these animals from all the crops that you grow and manage because it's killing all the, the mice and the, and the ground animals and the rabbits and all them, because you have to, you know, teal and, and you're basically killing all these animals that, you know, they claim that you kill more animals through growing crops than you do well, I'm, eating that, the animals. Argument, but anyway. it's, that's very debatable, right? I mean, it's very debatable because, um, well, let, let, let me put it this way. The solution there, no matter what, is permaculture and or regenerative agriculture, but more likely permaculture, because if you're doing permaculture, you're growing food in harmony with the way nature intended, with the way God intended, which is harmonious. You're not tilling the soil, and actually you wouldn't kill any animals, in fact. But also yeah. people who are hardcore vegans that say uh, no animals, that's also the wrong approach. We need animals. We need animals for the soil. We need animals on the earth. We, you know, we, we can live a symbiotic relationship. I love you. You said you have an animal sanctuary there. You have a goat right outside your window, you know, and that's, yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's fantastic. Like that's a relationship. Well, they're, re they're rescued animals. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I'll let you know, we also have a organic, we have a garden. Uh, we have a, a youth program and we have uh, kids, school kids coming here every day. Um, and they um, hang out with the animals and they learn that the animals are their friends. And then they go to our garden, which is basically permaculture. Um, and they learn how to grow um, crops. And we, I don't know how many different, I think we probably have, it's a very small plot, but we probably have about 75 different plants growing there, including some rare ones. We have a plant called wasabina, which is sort of like a, it tastes like wasabi. It's very spicy. Um, you know, we've got Malabar spinach and, and just a lot of things that people have never seen before. And they go, what is this? And we've got native crops growing as well, uh, native California uh, plants um, and amaranth and, and all this sort of stuff that's that's growing there. Um, and uh, we don't till um, the kids plant. They they um, they do a little bit of weeding occasionally. And because we do have a farmed animal sanctuary and the animals are all rescued, we have a lot of compost. So, um, you know, from having to muck their manure every single day and we use it in the garden. I mean, we don't have a problem with that. Um, and as long as there are animals on the earth, even if we were to close all the factory farms, I mean, there's still going to be the issue of, okay, so what do you do? How do you take care of the animals and, until their natural lives come to an end? Um, so there's going to be, let's just say a lot of shit. Uh, for a number of years that could uh, be very well utilized, even if we stop eating animals. Um, and I don't have a problem with that. As long as the animals are, are um, not being slaughtered, they're cared for. Um, you know, they can move to some sort of sanctuary model. Um, but I think it's really important to teach kids about the individuals that animals are every single animal is an individual and they have different personalities and when they get to know them it's just like getting to know your dog or cat um and you realize how unique they are their personalities and and um sometimes it's even more fun uh kids are just shocked when they find out that one goat likes to play pranks and you know there's a another pig that um likes to play with a certain toy or, or whatever. And, and they, they just absolutely love to see that. And then they go to the garden, get their hands in the soil and they learn about how food is grown. Um, one of the things today that I've noticed is that a lot of kids, especially in urban settings have no idea where food comes from. They think it comes from the store that it comes out of a package. Right. And most kids see more food in packages than they do uh, in their unadulterated state. Like they don't even know what that looks like. Everything is in a box or a plastic bag. And so really being able to show them, this is how, this is how, you know, um, a grain grows. This is what wheat looks like. This is what corn looks like. This is, uh, these are all these different vegetables that you can put in your salad, not just lettuce. It makes a huge impact on on kids at a very young age in their formative stages as they begin to think about food. So what do you think is a solution to that for 
educating kids, children, or future generations uh, about where food comes from. Also, having a part in the food production. You know, just 100 years ago, we had a massive percentage of small family farms here in the U.S. Um, I think it was after World War II. Then we had yes. all, of, all of the victory gardens that were planted in people's backyards. I mean, most food was coming from individual or small farms or small family farms, which, which is fantastic. That's, that's food. That is um, self-sustainability. It is national security. I mean, now you have yes. these massive monoculture crops. Most of that food here in the States isn't even for us to eat. It's GMO corn and soy. That's exactly that's, my, yeah. Yeah, that's made for either processed food. They put into ultra processed food, you know, um, high fructose corn syrup, exactly. things like that. Or they send it to the factory farm to feed the cows an unnatural diet. Right. I mean, corn and soy. Or they go into bags of potato chips or yeah, junk it goes food. to it goes to chickens, it goes to potato chips, it goes to to cows. And so, I mean, even if you're eating meat and and dairy and eggs that's conventionally produced. Look at the data. I mean, the amount of nutrition that's in that is so significantly less than what you would get from, you know, regeneratively um, uh, grown, you know, animals that are that are free range. And I'm not condoning to eat animals, I, but I believe in freedom of choice as well. I'm just saying, look at what happens when we separate ourselves from nature. And then we have, you know, a few huge companies that are basically doing all of our farming for us. What happens if if you don't have access to that? I mean, you know, well, much of you the have electricity. Doesn't. You have electricity go out for a day. By day, you know, it, people are going crazy. By day three, you have no more food in the grocery stores. Right, so we have no food independence here in this country anymore. But we That's, used to. Yes, we used to have it. We used to have food sovereignty. We used to have food independence, and we need to get back to that. And we need to start educating our children from a young age. We need more community gardens. We need to go into, uh, you know, the so-called uh, underserved communities where they have no access to food. Uh, there aren't even any grocery stores. Um, there's, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken. And start planting these gardens in vacant lots. I mean, we need to, every neighborhood should have a community farm where they can go and participate in growing or harvest, uh, at least in harvesting, or, you know, maybe they, they don't want to do that. They, they buy it, but they, I mean, that's, that is food security. We've got to be able to have access to fresh food locally everywhere in this country. And kids need to get back into get their hands in the soil. I mean, there is a, a, a real issue of whether or not we're going to have enough farmers in the future. Because the 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 majority of farmers are aging out. Um, they're controlled by the large corporations being told what to grow. So as you were talking about, it's soy and corn and weed. And you know, you just see like it, miles and miles of that when you're driving through the Midwest instead of small family farms that were growing probably 30, 40, 50 different types of crops, you know, 60, 70 years ago. Um, so we've got monoculture happening. Um, and if you're right, if there is an electrical outage, if there's some sort of, it's all tight, it's too globalized. So if something fails at the top, the, 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 there's going to be a massive, massive trickle down effect to every community in the world. So we do need to start localizing food again. I mean, it's critical to food security, human health, uh, the health of the planet, uh, gener regeneration of the soil. I mean, it's just absolutely critical. And I think that starts with teaching kids about it. We don't teach kids about food, how to eat. The USDA school lunch program is criminal. It's a crime, what, what is served. Um, I have a neighbor who showed me what their child got for lunch. It was neatly packaged in a plastic bag. There was not one fresh item in it. Every single thing was packaged. It was packaged processed cheese. There were some sort of crackers in there. Um, there was packaged applesauce. Um, I can't remember. Like it was so bad, some processed ham or something like that. Um, nothing fresh at all. And when you're feeding kids that, and sometimes there are kids that that's the only place they eat is in school. Mm -hmm. And if our schools are saying, this is what you're supposed to eat, how are those kids going to be able to make any decisions about their food choices as they get older. 
Not to mention the fact that they're not going to be able to think clearly or perform well in school on food like that. Right. So what we're doing today to, uh, is in the school system is absolutely criminal. And it's because the corporations determined that, um, you know, we have this massive subsidy program. Um, we have um, 1.3 billion pile, uh, pounds of cheese that's stockpiled in by the U.S. government to disseminate through uh, the school lunch program and uh, the SNAP program uh, mm. to underserved communities because, um you know, the government has committed to buy uh, a certain amount of dairy from the the dairies. And uh, if, if there's a surplus, um, we just dump it on on kids and poor communities. I mean, it really is criminal. And we, we need to deglobalize food. We need to relocalize it. People who seem to be running the world right now do not want that to happen, you know? Um, no. I mean, they're trying to make it more globalized. They're trying to have more global laws and trying to have, you know, top countries uh, working together to basically control everything that goes on in our lives. Um, and they don't want us having localized food, localized laws, localized decisions. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're working very uh strategically behind the scenes to to actually prevent that from happening and to your point about school systems i mean when i went to school i had this huge awakening uh, very young actually uh I, I mean i was probably seventh and eighth grade seventh or eighth grade i noticed the school tr the trucks that were delivering the food to our schools for some reason i made this connection were the same trucks that were delivering the same food to the prisons and I remember saying at school mm. lunch, they're feeding us prison food. And I got in trouble, you know, <laughs> sent me to the principal's office again. I think I was like, you know, 12, 10, 11, 12 years old. And I just made that connection of like, we're like little prisoners here in this school. And they're giving us these trays and giving us this prison food. Um, I didn't know anything about health back then. And in fact, I got really sick as a teenager, you know, eating a standard American diet and it wasn't until years later that I was able to reclaim my health, you know, switching my diet. But I'm not condoning that you should feed prisoners bad food. In fact, I'm saying the opposite. You should feed prisoners organic food and give them real food, just like we should in schools. There was a study done years ago, small study at one school where they basically swapped out all the food for organic food and, and a lot of whole foods. So a lot of mm -hmm. fruits, a lot of vegetables, things like that, and did an entire school lunch program organic and i can't remember how long they did it for i think they tracked the progress for for the course of one year and wow. what happened in that school was unbelievable all wow. of the score testing went up exponentially their grades went up exponentially the amount of days missed in school went down exponentially the amount of fights went down the amount of um you know, kids getting kicked out of school went down. The amount of kids graduating to the next grade went up. Every psychological, you know, emotional, psychosocial, and even health metric that you could measure of kids' success in school improved significantly just by changing the food to organic and giving more real food options. Which oh, no, no, that, you and I, yeah. and to a lot of us who study this and live this way, it's like, well, of course that would happen. That's a no brainer. You know, you get the poisons oh. out and this ultra processed food out and the toxins out. Of course, they're going to be better, smarter, think better, have more energy, get in less fights, be less depressed. Uh, it's a no brainer, but that's not where our subsidies are right now. And so as parents, you yeah. know, my kids, we provide their lunch every day, right? Like I could never depend on them eating lunch in the schools that they go to. So we provide their lunch. And as a parent, that's kind of what you have to do right now. But also it's like, what can you do at a larger level? Well, you know, at that point you have to get involved in, in politics and, and vote for people who are going to fix that. But that's hard. You know, it's hard. It's like you have to take individual action for your kids. You can't depend on the schools. And like you said, some people, they don't have the money to provide their own lunch for their kids. And, and that's the only place those kids get to eat is at school. So that's, that's very sad and very challenging. But for most parents and most kids, I don't know if it's most, for a large percentage, they do have the choice and you can choose to give your kids better foods. Well, we have to remember, I mean, first of all, I love that story about that school. I wonder what happened to them um, after that, the year went by. But I mean, I think we have to remember that 
the middle class is shrinking in this country and there is a growing uh, base of, of people that just are having trouble making ends meet. Um, and so that the, the, the percentage of kids going to school and, and trying to get most of their calories from the school, I, I really do think that's going to increase in the future. So this is something that we have to think about. There are organizations that are working on it. Uh, I know that in New York City, they're now, um, I believe, beginning to take that seriously. A lot of the schools have more fresh food. But, you know, when I think about places like, I, I go to Italy every single year. I, it's a country that really fascinates me because they really held on to the old ways of doing things in so many ways. Um, and so um, every school provides lunch. Um, and it's a three-course lunch. You have the first course, and then you have the second course, and then you have the third course. Um, and it's similar in Japan. Um, they have uh, a very fresh, um, you know, you have your soup and your rice and probably, I don't know, fish, whatever, vegetables. Um, and then you have to clean your dishes at the end of the day. And um, there are places in the world where they actually serve real food. Um, it's particularly America that is leading the way in terms of processed food. Um, so the world over, for example, I was in, I think it was Slovenia and we were, I was on a bus and we got off the bus at a truck stop and I thought, oh my God, what am I going to eat at this truck stop? And I go in there and right in front of me is basically a farmer's market. There are just bushels of all these different kinds of fresh fruit and vegetables. They're actually selling farm fresh goods right there at a truck stop in Slovenia. Um, and then, you know, they, they had all these soups and salads and pastas, uh, many of which were naturally vegan. And so the fact is, in many parts of the world, people are eating much more naturally than we are here. In the, it's the United States that's leading charge uh, in, in terms of uh, packaged foods, thinking that this is how we eat. And so we have a, we, you know, we have our work cut out for us. I mean, that's why we're falling behind, I believe, in education. I don't know how we rank at this point, but I think we're pretty far down on the list of, um, on that list of, uh, you know, educational ranking. And other countries are outperforming us. And I don't think it's just because of the rigorousness of their education, but what they're feeding their kids. I mean, if you're getting a proper meal in Italy, whether it's, you know, it's likely not vegan, but at least you're getting a balanced meal. It, um, you're going to perform much better. Um, and so this is a serious issue that we have to deal with. And I think it's our collective responsibility. Um, it's sure, if we're able to pack a lunch for our kids, that's great. But what about all these other kids that don't have that option? So we really do have to do something at the legislative level. Yeah. And I found that article um about the school, it, you're going to find this interesting. It was actually in your oh, neck okay. of the woods in Marin. Oh, uh, is this in uh, Marin City? It must be yeah. Marin City. This was in South Salido, Marin City yep. School District. Yep. yep. Uh, it was 20, 2015, and they did 100% organic, non-GMO. And what they found was, um, well, I remember a different reading at a different time. Like it was still only like a dollar twenty or a dollar seventy per meal or something. It was still very mm -hmm. affordable, really. But one of the stats: sixty-seven percent dec decrease in disciplinary problems and an increase in attendance. It just shows you how related your food yeah. is to your mental health. And these kids, I mean. Kids, depression is higher than ever. Anxiety is higher than ever. School shootings is higher than ever. Um, you know, all the, you know, just a, a sense of like um, mental anxiety. And we know, I mean, the science is really clear that our food directly impacts our brain and impacts our yes. nervous system. And when you're full of ultra processed food with all kinds of chemicals, additives, fillers, high processed sugar, no. it is going to impact you significantly more negatively. And I mean, this was a great test. Back to your, um, back to your uh, And I, by the way, this, this is Conscious Kitchen. I know them, I know Judy Schills. Um, I've worked with her in the past, she's great. And they are doing amazing work uh, with schools. Yeah, so, I'm, very, uh, I'm very curious shout, if they're still if yeah. they're still doing it. But uh, you said it was Conscious Schools as her program. Conscious Kitchen is the program that oh, is uh, that's the nonprofit. Yeah, 
Um, so that's awesome. But yeah, it's cool things yeah. like that. I mean, it's, you know, little, little anecdotal examples like that, that are actually pretty significant just goes to show you how important, but if we're depending on giant corporations to provide all of our food for us, um, again, and getting away from more local and regional farms, we're missing the boat and we're missing out on a lot of, a lot of the potential, the health potential, the sustainability right. potential, the regenerative potential. Cause even those corporations that do um, organic and I always recommend people go organic, you're not gonna get rid of hundred percent of pesticides and chemicals, but you're going to get rid of a lot of them, which is significantly yeah. better for you, the animals and the planet. Right. Um, but even then they're doing huge monoculture crops, you know, it's organic. They are. But it's monoculture, but it's which is critical. not not a, you know not no. sustainable for the planet long term. Now, a lot of them do rotational cropping because you have to if you're doing organic, which is better for the soil. But it's still not anywhere near ideal. No, no, we need to get back to really supporting crop diversity, uh, expanding to more heritage crops, uh, heirloom crops, etc. And and permaculture. So I mean, a everything you're saying is absolutely. Um, spot on and you know i think this is going to have to be a grassroots movement um because that's really the only way to grassroots and legislative actions are the only way to really fight these uh large corporate interests um unfortunately uh there's a big segment of the so-called vegan movement that is sort of following in the corporate footsteps and and it's uh it's unfortunate so i wanted to ask you earlier, but we kind of went on a, a couple different uh, tangents there, which was wonderful. Um, but I want to ask you about animals and souls. Do you believe animals have a soul? All, do you believe all animals have a soul? And if so, why or, or why not? Okay. Uh, wow. We we're going to do some deep philosophy here. <laughs> um, I would say yes. I, I do believe that all animals have a soul. Um, just to give you an um, insight into my my religious background, I was raised a Buddhist. Um, and Are you Japanese? I, I'm assuming you're Japanese, right? Miyoko, I'm Japanese. Japanese name. Yeah. 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 Um, and I can't say that I'm a practicing Buddhist, but there is a a scripture. You know, there are in the in the uh, the Lotus Sutra. It does say that um, all all beings are sentient. All living beings on the planet are sentient and possess a soul. And I think I have always believed that. It's just sort of a, a we don't, there is no God in Buddhism. There is no external, external deity that we pray to uh, because the Buddha lies within each of us. That Buddha is a state of consciousness that um, is attainable by all living beings. They're all, they're in all of us or it is, it resides in all of us. But I have also seen the soul um, in various animals. Um, I'm gonna just tell you one little story about consciousness in animals um, and their ability to care about others. Um, so I think I told you earlier, there was a, a goat that was at my window, Madeline, who was very, very sick at one time and almost died. And she, I cared for her in my house for about two months. She went through this weird period where she didn't eat for about a month and yet she wouldn't die. It was very, very weird. She didn't drink water and nothing. Um, no one really, she went, she was in and out of the hospital. No one knew what was wrong with her. They'd never seen anything like this before. Um, but every time I talked about, you know, in front of her, we talk about euthanasia. She would like, her eyes would pop wide open. All of a sudden she'd just jump up and she'd go over to a house plant and nibble a leaf for a little bit. And then she'd collapse again. But it was as if she was telling us, no, I don't put me down. I'm not ready to die. Well, and, and, the goats, day, and goats have the most crazy oh, yes. eyes and they the do. most human like little, and the most human screams yes. you'll ever hear. It is, yes. it is almost, yes. it's almost yes. eerie. You're like, is there a human in that goat right there? Yes. We used to have goats. No, so, yeah, it's crazy. It is, yeah, it's crazy. But anyway, so we, we didn't put her down. And then one day, I guess she decided she was going to be well. And she started eating again and she came back to life. And then she got very, very aggressive for a while. She um, headbutted a donkey 
uh, who's, you know, three times her size. And I think it was to prove that, hey, I'm back, I'm alive, <laughs> um, you know, I'm not going down. And so one day I took the goats on a hike and we were up on a ridge and there was a big ravine and Madeline decided, I guess she was trying to prove to me that she was fully alive and she started attacking me. And she was up, you know, rearing up on her hind legs and like coming down with her horns. And I started screaming and she would not stop. And I really thought that I was going to be that sanctuary casualty that you read about <laughs> once in a while. Like, I thought this is it. Like I am like, I've never feared for my life. Like Be I did that. Vegan moment. woman killed, mauled by goat that she <laughs> saved. You're like, yes. oh God. Oh my. No. no, exactly. But out of the blue, Rufus and Reggie appeared at my side and chased away Madeline and saved my life. Rufus and Reggie are two other goats and they were way at the top of a hill and they saw, they saw me being attacked and they literally ran down to chase her away and protect me. And then as we walked down the hill, they never left my side. Mm. And this is not typical behavior, but you know, th they knew I was in danger. They care about me. Um, it wasn't about food. Uh, you know, it wasn't like, Hey, they came down, they saw that I had a snack or anything like that, but they saw that I was in danger and they wanted to make sure that no harm came to me. Um, so do I think that animals have souls? I think they have souls, but beyond that, I think they have consciousness. I think they have awareness. I think they have understanding. I think they have intelligence that we have underestimated, which actually shows how stupid we are because we think that animals that don't speak our language are incapable of language. And that is absolutely false. In fact, it's interesting how so many animals learn our language, but we can't learn theirs. So who's really stupid in this argument? <laughs> That's a funny way to look at it. It's true. I mean, it's so true. I mean, they learn our language, but we don't learn theirs. And they speak a language. You know, it's, yes. it is clear. I mean, they are communicating with us. I can see it in my own dogs. You know, I have two dogs, a brother and sister, and I've learned to communicate with them. I mean, when they want something, need something, when they just want love or need love or like, you know, something's hurting, whatever. It's like I can send and anybody who, you know, spends time around animals has the same experience where you can sense kind of what they need. You know, it's almost sometimes an, an, an invisible underlying communication. It's, it's intuitive more than it is actual. And I think that's the language. It's an intuitive language uh, that we have to learn with animals. And, and when you listen, you can actually feel or hear what they're, what they need or what they're sharing with you. Um, and, and your story, you know, the goat saving you, it's, funny but it's also so amazing because there are so many stories like that that i've watched online that are inspiring you know whether it's dolphins that have saved a surfer from a shark attack you know this person doesn't raise the dolphins the dolphins saw no. that the shark was going for the human and the dolphins attacked the shark and send it away you know why did they save that surfer um you know people who have raised lion you know saved lions uh, and then raise them and then let them into the wild and then come back years later and the lion tackles them and gives them a big hug. You know, it looks like he's going to eat them. And instead, it, it, you know, it hugs the person. You know, and normally this would be a lion that you'd be afraid of is going to eat you. You know, that mm -hmm. you have that bond. Where does that relationship come from? Where, how can lions, horses, dogs, cows, goats, sheep, pigs, even chickens, anybody who's ever raised chickens, we had chickens for a few years, know that chickens can have really interesting, you know, unique personalities and, um, and can even get close to, I mean, if you go look on YouTube and look at the chickens that are like playing pianos chickens and videos. stuff. I'm like, what? Yes. Oh. <laughs> I'm like, chickens are so stupid. And then I see them playing pianos. I'm like, whoa, they're actually yes. pretty smart. <laughs> um, you know, and so, I have to agree. I, I really think animals now, except for fish, I don't know if fish have souls. That's hard for me. I, I, I would think I, I'm partly joking, but, um, did you see the movie, the octopus? Oh, the, my octopus teacher. Is that the one? Yeah. yeah my octopus teacher. Right. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I, 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 I agree. I think all animals actually have souls and have consciousness 
fish or not, you know, aquatic animals, any animal you ever spend time with has a soul. And that's the hard part for me. It's like, how could I ever, number one, knowing health wise, I could be vegan or vegetarian or whole food plant-based and thrive for the rest of my life. I know that mm -hmm. most people don't know that most people are not aware of that. Most people don't realize that you can be very healthy on a vegan or vegetarian diet or a whole food plant-based diet. Um, yes, you may need to supplement a few things, but we have that today, access to it easily. Yes, you need to learn about which foods to eat and which ones not to. Yes, you may have some gut issues with certain foods and you have to experiment with that. Yes, these are real problems that people experience today, but these are problems that we have answers to. We have solutions to, yeah, you can take a B12 supplement. If you don't get enough sunshine, you can take a vitamin D supplement. These are simple things we have access to today and, and you can thrive on on these diets. But at the end of the day, when, so number one, I know health wise, I can thrive for the rest of my life. Number two, I could never see myself eating another animal again, because I, I believe they have souls and I've seen that they have consciousness. And it's like, how could I intentionally contribute into the murder of that animal just to feed my body when I know I can get everything I need from plants, and or maybe exactly. a couple of supplements if I need it, you know? It's like, how could I do that? I just don't, I don't and have that in me meat, anymore. Yeah, even if you eat meat, I mean, it's shown that a lot of uh, people that eat meat are vitamin B12 deficient. Right, and D, and because vitamin well, D, and a lot and of other D. nutrient deficiencies right. as well. Yeah, you have to have right. a well-planned omnivore diet, um, oftentimes mm -hmm. with supplements, if you're going to thrive long-term as well, for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, right. And so... Yeah. um so you believe animals have souls um, and consciousness. I do too. I think anyone that spends time around animals. Now, how do you feel about, I saw this woman post the other day, she was riding a horse and, you know, a bunch of vegans that follow her, like started posting a bunch of hate. How could you do that to the horse? How could you ride a horse? And da, da, da. And I'm like, I'm, I'm more on the side of, look, I've spent time around horses. My, my aunt and cousins had horses growing up. Um, I used to ride, I've ridden horses bareback. I was a kid riding a, on a horse with my sister and I've seen the relationship you can have with horses and they actually, I feel like they have a sense of purpose with the person who is caretaking them or their owner, you could call them, um, and letting you ride on them and, and, and having some enjoyment in a purpose there. And so I know this is kind of polarizing for vegan. It, it, it gets to the extreme. Veganism can go to the extreme. And that's, that's the thing I'm trying to do now is like, hey, look, let's find a balance point. Let's bring people, Buddhism specifically is about balance, right? It's about equanimity. It's about finding neutrality. Um, I've studied Buddhism as well. I love Buddhism. I, I find it, caveat, I find it funny when I talk to Christians where they think Buddhism is a false deity because Buddha is a false god that you you pray to, and it's like Buddhism has Buddha's not god in Buddhism at all. You you miss the point. You obviously don't understand Buddhism. You should study it before you make claims like that. Actually, Buddhism is not claiming that Buddha is god, and you're praying to a false deity. I, I wanted to mention that because I thought it was funny, but um, I went off on that track, and I forgot what I was even saying. Um, you were talking about horses and uh, maybe, yeah, yeah. so where, where do you feel about horses? Yeah. I mean, where do you feel about like, you know, raising animals, being with animals, riding horses, things like that? You know, there is a, a woman who calls herself the vegan cowboy and I, a cowgirl, and she has a different philosophy about horses. She's probably more aligned with you. I am surrounded by equestrian centers because um, I'm out in the country here. And, uh, you know, just about everybody here rides. I rode when I was a child. Um, uh, even after I became vegetarian, I think when I was 12, I still rode a little bit, um, not a lot, but, um, you know, what I would say about horses is the saddest thing is that, um, even among equestrians, the average horse changes ownership, quote unquote, five times. So people get rid of their horses, um, and then they pass them down. And it often happens with geriatric horses that can't be ridden anymore. So I think that is the hardest thing. I mean, I, I do believe that, let's say you have a horse that you love, that loves you, and you have a bond. Um, and the horse may enjoy uh, going on a, a hike with you, being ridden. I, like, it, you know, a couple hundred pounds on a, whatever, 1,500 pound animal probably isn't a whole lot. 
Um, and um, it could be mutually enjoyable. Um, but the fact remains that horses are utilized, brutalized in horse racing, in uh, pulling buggies in New York City, um, as well as um, I see a lot of sad horses standing alone in paddocks when I drive down the road here. They're just standing there with their head hung low without a friend, or they're, they stand in a stall all day long waiting for someone to come and take them out for, um, for a run or a romp. And so that is my biggest issue is, you know, what is that level of um, keeping your horse? A lot of um, equestrians here believe that, oh, my horse is, you know, a, a thoroughbred Arabian, whatever, and um, uh, I won't allow him to um, associate with other horses. It's just, he's got to be by himself. I don't think the horse feels that way. The horse <laughs> doesn't want weird. to be alone. Yeah. But, you know, but there are a lot of uppity equestrians that, believe you know they're they're horses for show right um and and therefore it has to be taken care of and it has to be alone in its stall and i just don't think from the i don't think any animal wants to be alone i don't think any animal wants to stand in a stall all day long or right. in a paddock by himself or herself and so if a horse can be given a good life and you take care of that horse your entire life and not get rid of it when it's aged out and no longer able to be ridden um, when the veterinary costs start to rise, then I think it is possible for a horse and a human to have a relationship and a bond. Yeah, that's beautiful. I think it's, I think that's the nuance and the context that's needed on a, on a mm -hmm. bigger scale around all of our relationships with animals, right? Because honey from bees, for example. So I actually consider honey to be vegan. Most vegans would disagree with me. But the reason being is I, I, I experimented when I live in San Diego with a, um, with a wild beehive that was actually in my backyard in between uh, mm -hmm. these, this fence. And, and I had this theory that like, hey, if I have a good communication and harmony with the bees, with animals in general, they're happy mm -hmm. to share their food with me. And we know honey is an incredible medicine. We know it is incredibly healing, you know, for humans and for bees. Mm -hmm. We know it's their food, but we also know on the commercial side of things, bees are raped and pillaged and it's awful. Just like commercial, you yes. know, animals raising is, is terrible. Commercial chickens and eggs, it's terrible how mm -hmm. they're treated. And they, you know, they get little tiny, they don't get to move their box or from their little tiny box their whole life. And it's, it is very inhumane, but I believe there is a humane way to do some things like vegetarian who eats eggs. You know, you can have free range chickens that are happy moving around the entire property. And, you know, we went to Mexico. My wife's family has chickens down there. They roam the whole property, you know, and they lay eggs in a few places and, you know, her family eats the eggs and, and then those chickens sleep up in the tree at night, you know, like those are, that's like someone living in harmony with the animals and those animals are providing. Uh, but back to the bee story. So I actually um, reached my hand into the hive this is a wild hive, mind you. And okay. like was You're a brave man. I was Nathan. intuitively. Yeah, it was, you know, I was in, I had to keep my, my nerves under control intuitively communicating with them saying, Hey, you know, asking them, may I have some of your honey? May I take some of your comb and like mm -hmm. feeling, you know, having this conversation, I broke off a piece of the comb, pulled it out and it was, you know, small, you know, they had four or five huge combs. So I took 5% of it, right? Not very much. And had bees all over my arm and my bite, no smoke, no nothing. Right. I wanted to prove this to myself, this theory that I had crawled all over me. I, Put the comb down, you know, kind of swiped off some of the bees very slowly, didn't hurt any of them. They eventually left the comb and then I ate it right there with them. And I, and I had this like realization of like they, I felt like they were happy to share that abundance with me in that situation. Okay. And by the way, I'm not encouraging anyone to go out and do this. The reason I took this video down, <laughs> I, I took this video down from YouTube 10 or 12 <laughs> years ago when I did it a long time, it was 12, 13 years ago was because I went out another time and mm -hmm. a different day. And I was like, I was like, okay, here we go again. So same thing, bees all over me, no problem. But when I went to 
take a piece of the comb off, it it was too big of a piece, okay? I got greedy, I think is what happened. And then when I tried to pull it through the little fence, it wouldn't fit. And so um, I think what I did was either drop it or something. When I pulled my hand through, like I, I literally felt and heard however many hundreds of thousands of bees drop. And it was like, okay, I'm dead. You know, I, I immediately took off running and I got stung like 20 times all over my body, all over my head, my neck, I had all over. And it was brutal. And it was a big lesson for me. It was a big lesson of like, yeah, they may be happy to share their honey with you, but if you take too much and you get greedy, that's when you've crossed over the line. And so there are beekeepers who take good care of their bees who never take too much, you know, and their bees are free around organic orchards and things like that. They don't travel them across the country. They don't take them to GMO crops. And it's like, these are people who live in harmony with their bees. And in that case, I think that's the most vegan thing you could do. You know, (laughs) the bees go to the nectar. I mean, think about it, divine nectar from a flower, drink it, have a magical God given process that creates honey and then spits out this honey. That's this incredible medicine. And they always produce way more than enough. And as long as you never take too much, they always have enough for more than enough for, for them and their babies. So I know many vegans would disagree with me on that, but that's, that's been my perspective. I think you can extrapolate that to all of our relationships with animals, like you with the goats, for example, you know, it's, it's very, very nuanced. I mean, it really is because is that something that's, I mean, the thing is that humankind, humans always want to replicate things in a commercial manner. Right. And so the question is, can that be commercialized in a no. way that everyone can have honey at any time? And, and Probably you not. can't, and, and that's the same thing with, you know, whether it's dairy or meat or anything. I mean, if you go back to doing things where you're living with nature, you can't commercialize it so that everyone has access at all times. The only now, thing- Now, local, can- I would say- I would push back a little bit on that because if you're supporting a local organic farm, you know, where they're, you know, you know, have a a good relationship in that sense, then, then you can do it on a smaller level. Right. But not on a large commercial level, like nationwide. It has, it has to go back to our first or what we were talking about earlier, like small local farms. Right. Right. Small local farms. I mean, but if it's still animal agriculture, you know, even the small local producers will tell you that, yeah, it's going to be much more expensive. And so you're only going to be able to feed a certain percentage of people of a certain class. Uh, it's not, it can't be done in a way that it can feed the masses. The only thing that you can grow enough to feed the masses are plants. Uh, and if you do, you know, if, if we go back to small local farms, growing heritage crops, heirloom crops, you know, crop diversity, we still can feed everyone in America. We, we still can feed everyone everywhere with less land, less resources. Um, it's hard to do that when you're trying to maintain balance with any sort of animal. Um, let's go back to chickens that you were talking about, uh, the chickens you saw in Mexico. And it, you know it is true. I mean, I was in Cuba recently and yeah, there's chickens running around and pick, people picking up their eggs. And, uh, but at the same, you know, we also have chickens here um, at the sanctuary, they're all uh, rescues from factory farms. And the fact is, um, chickens don't lay eggs in the winter. So if you live in uh, a warm climate, you know, a tropical climate that's warm year round, they may lay chicken, they may, they're jungle fowl. So they may lay eggs year round. But uh, in the Northern hemisphere, chickens went in the winter time, their body, body sort of shut down. And you may not, you're going to have to keep feeding them if you have a backyard flock. You still have to feed your flock, even if they're not laying very often. You know, they may start laying only once, I don't know, once every two weeks, once every month, whatever. You might not get any eggs in the winter. And the older they get, the fewer eggs they lay. Um, So if you've got a chicken that lives their natural lifespan, which is eight to 10 years, by then they're not laying any eggs or they might lay an egg once every six months. And you still have to feed that chicken if you're going to live in harmony with nature. Um, and if you're going to treat the animal humanely. So it beco- that becomes a very expensive egg. If you get that egg once every six months, that's an expensive egg. Um, and most people don't have the resources for just for chickens just to 
walk around the yard and hunt and peck and eat worms and not be fed supplementally. Yeah, you need um, a big, very... you need a good size property for that. Absolutely, yes. Ac like acres. Yes. Yeah, multiple acres. Yeah. So, yeah. So there's a lot there. There's a backyard chicken movement right now. A lot of people have that, but I can't tell you how many chickens we have also rescued from these backyard chicken operations where somebody will call us and they say, "Hey, um, you know, I just got some new chick, some new uh, chicks," and it turns out uh, a couple of them are roosters, and we our city ordinance won't let us have roosters. Um, and so what do we do? Or, you know, Hey, my chickens are old. They're not laying eggs anymore. Um, can you take our chickens so we can get some new ones? So once again, you know, it's a very nuanced discussion. It's not just factory farms are terrible, but backyard hens are fine. I mean, that's not the case either. Um, how do you feel about spiders? <laughs> Oh, I leave them alone. Um, <laughs> I uh, I carefully removed one from the house the other day. Um, you don't kill them. You don't kill a spider. You don't kill. Like, no, I try to. Black, I try to if you like have a black uh, widow with eggs in your bathroom. What would you do? Oh my god, I'd freak out. I haven't seen that yet. <laughs> I, did see, I did see a black. Wit um, I, I do. I don't know if it was a black widow or not. I couldn't turn it over. Um, but I uh, just very carefully slid a put a cup over it slid a paper under it and then took it outside um i've had scorpions in 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 the house before not in this house but in another house um and uh just kind of captured and removed them you know what i don't think you know the one critter insect animal whatever i don't know if i'd call it an animal cockroach that i don't think no cockroaches i don't think they're as bad as we make them out to be uh okay. I think they're just a big beetle you know it's just we have all these ideas about them that make them seem bad no it's, um in uh what am i saying mosquitoes i don't think mosquitoes have souls i think they're the most soulless oh, okay. blood-sucking creature on the planet <laughs> okay i don't know i got i got stung a couple days ago in two places and uh oh my god no i'm not a fan of mosquitoes i will um i will definitely smack them <laughs> no but i i mean it's it's an interesting conversation like if because i also practice compassion for animals and i have saved many 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 spiders my kids know my wife knows like you know she'll stomp them but i most spiders critters things like that bugs beetles all that it's like i pick them up or i'll put them on a piece of paper and take them outside no problem mm -hmm. the the other day, or this was a while ago, you know, there was a big black widow in our bathroom that had laid eggs. And oh with two kids, I was just like, I can't have that. I'm sorry. I cannot have the, the, the risk of all, you know, thousands of these spiders being born, the spider moving, you know, potentially biting one of my kids. Like I just, as a father, I couldn't do it. And, and I killed, I killed that one in those eggs, you know, and uh, I felt bad about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I still did it. It's like, as my protective nature as a father, I have to look out for my kids first. But I think in most, you know, that's, that's obviously an extreme example. But um, I think, you know, compassion is compassion. And, and we're not gonna be perfect 100% of the time. But I think the act of thinking and practicing as much as we possibly can, goes a long way. No, absolutely. No, I mean, we're never going to be perfect beings. Um, and, you know, once again, um, you have to determine where you are, time and place, and decide what the right action is, depending on that. And it might rem it might mean killing a black widow. Um, and I will not judge you for that, Nathan. <laughs> I would have done the same. <laughs> well, thank you. It's okay if you do. People can judge me. It's okay. <laughs> um, but so you you um you founded a company called Miyoko Creamery, right? Um, Miyoko Creamery. Uh huh which is funny because I had some of that, some of your, some of the Miyoko vegan butter on my toast this morning. Um, not oh, even, you? not okay. even making the connection that we were having an interview today. Okay. That's funny. All and right. it's my, fa it's, it's my, mo it's, it's addictive. It's so good. It is so good. So well, you, did you. you come up with that recipe yourself? Like how did that work? I did. I did. Um, and it's, uh, it was based on a recipe I published in my book, the homemade vegan pantry. Um, and I have new versions, uh, on my YouTube channel. I have a way, um, I have a recipe for making your own spreadable vegan butter. 
So you can learn how to make it uh, yourself. Um, but I, it was really the first butter in the marketplace that used a cultured milk. So in other words, a fermented milk, which gives it that sort of a little bit of tang, sort of a European style. Yeah. It's so good. It's, it's coconut yeah. oil. It's simple too. I like the reason it's organic, which is we buy as much organic as we possibly can. It's, um, it's, uh, coconut oil. It's simple. Coconut oil, salt, some, what is the cashew, cashew, cashew milk? Is it fermented cashew yep, milk? Cashew milk yep, fermented cashew milk mm -hmm. with, with, um, with probiotics basically, is it lactobacillus or what do you ferment it with? Yeah. It's, it's a lactic acid bacteria that lowers the pH and uh, turns it into something that's like buttermilk. And then that gets churned with the coconut oil um, to produce that butter. It's delicious. And the cheese, I think you guys have a cheese too, right? Isn't there a cheese? Yeah, there, there's a bunch of cheeses. I'm, I'm no longer involved in the company. Um, we separated when our uh, different ways um, um, about a year ago, a year and a half ago. But um, yeah, we have a bunch, we had, um, well, they still have, cheeses that are mostly cashew based um, and they're all fermented. Um, everything uh, was organic. Uh, I think it's still organic. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know what. Um, so you're no longer part what, of the company, huh? No, I'm no longer part of the company. So I know I, you know, I was at the time you are what you eat was filmed mm -hmm. uh, and there's, I talk a lot about the company and the products, um, I'm, but I am no longer involved. Um, so, but uh, uh huh, go ahead. No, I, I am working on a new project. I have a, a new cookbook I'm working on. I'm under contract on called the Vegan Creamery, and that will have uh, all these new formulas, new cheeses that I've figured out how to make, uh, mostly without cashews. Um, really, le I've learned how to make curds out of the milk of all different types of seeds and legumes. So um, yeah, there's some, I would say next generation cheeses and butters in that book. I've watched some of your YouTube videos. It seems like you you really have a, such a strong passion for culinary arts, for the culinary arts, for cooking, for being creative with food. Would you say that's, that's a huge passion of yours? Uh, it's, it's just how my brain works. You know, I'm always thinking about food. <laughs> so. Who does it? I could do right? this. I, yeah, what about? Yeah, you're thinking yeah. about creating food. Most of us are just thinking about eating food. You know, I'm already thinking yeah. about my next meal. <laughs> um, about the twin experiment. So yeah, you were in that Netflix docu series. You are what you eat, right? The the experiment about twins. Tons of controversy around it right now. Rightly so. I think they, I think the study was really poorly done. But what is your, what was your like? thoughts about being in, in the docu-series and, and what do you know about kind of the controversy around the experiment itself? What are your thoughts around it in general? You know, I'm not really that familiar with the controversy itself. I know some people say it wasn't thorough. I think it was published. It was peer reviewed, but I, I didn't actually read it. So I can't really comment on that. Um, I thought it was a very entertaining uh, series. And it was uplifting, um, unlike his previous movie, The Game Changers, which I think really spoke to athletes and men. This one really spoke to a broader audience and uh, gave people, I think, a little bit of hope that they too could change their diet. You know, um, if these uh, twins could do it, they could do it. Um, and it was done with humor and all of that. So I thought it was... Uh, that was really well done as a, as a series. Um, it, I don't know how much I should say about it, but um, when he first approached me about it, there was a slightly different concept. And then I think it evolved over time um, into this one. And I think, you know, I think it was better. Um, hopefully, you know, I kind of wish that there would have been more emphasis on um how to prepare these healthier foods um, rather than uh, there were the prepackaged foods that the, 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 uh, the twins got the first month and they had to learn how to cook on their own, but more resources on, on, on how to prepare foods on your own. Cause I think at the end of the day, we have to stop relying on packaged foods and we need to get back into our kitchens and learn how to cook. And what are the shortcuts to doing so, et cetera. 
Um, and that's something that, you know, maybe there's a, a, a sequel that could come out that could help people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was cool that you were in the Netflix series, number one. Um, oh, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> you know, and I think, um, and, and I, I agree, I think it was well done. I think it was interesting. I think it was entertaining. It was a great way to, to kind of show people you know, what's probably because most of those people had no desire, you know, to even eat a vegan diet. Um, some of them were like, no, I don't want to, I don't want to. And then, you know, uh, and then some of them enjoyed it. And so it was, it, I, I think as a Netflix docuseries, you know, it was, it was well done. Um, mm -hmm. The criticisms come from the science itself, the experiment mm -hmm. itself. And the, so for people who don't know, you know, the, the scientific, um, study that was done that led to the docuseries created around the scientific study was, you know, comparing um, biomarkers, a few biomarkers of what happens when you eat a vegan diet versus a omnivore diet. And it was all planned, you know, it was controlled, the meals, the calories, etc. for the first part. And then they made their own meals for the next part. Right. right. Um, and the vegan diet showed more weight loss, lower LDL levels, uh, better fasting insulin. So most of the biomarkers were better. Longer telomeres. Longer telomeres. Longer telomeres. Most of the biomarkers were better on the vegan diet. The problem is it was not controlled properly. The vegan diet, the vegan uh, meals, they were given less calories than the omnivore, omnivore, omnivore uh -huh. meals, which was a really stupid mistake or where people think, well, it was intentionally biased towards veganism because the scientist, the doctor who led the study is a vegan and proposed veganism. He's a, I think he's a, te uh, a professor at Harvard, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so, yeah, it's like that. The problem with doing something like that is it just throws the whole baby out with the bathwater because if right. you give people a few hundred less calories, you're, you're going to lose, lose weight. weight. And if you lose weight, all your biomarkers go up. And so, right. of course, so it's like, why did he make such a stupid mistake like um a mistake it's like well maybe it was intentional and then that throws the whole experiment off and everyone just throws it all away and go oh it's it's worthless i don't think it's worthless i think i think the big takeaway there is you can thrive on a vegan diet if you control calories you can lose weight and improve all your biomarkers on a vegan diet and so you know people can take that away as a positive um but i just think that was poorly planned and executed on that part. I mean, they should have had equal calories. I mean, period. No, they really should have equal calories and equal macronutrient levels. hundred percent. Yeah. And yeah. so that was the other thing is actually the vegan, I think that study also the vegans had, um, less protein. Um, well, okay. Let's talk about that because the average American gets twice as much protein as they actually need. And that could be contributing to disease as well, too. And we're, we have we live in a protein obsessed country. Everyone is focusing on, but where do I get my protein? And you look at any vegan product. The first question people ask is, "What about the protein?" Right. Uh, and um, you know, I don't know. I never think about protein. I don't eat packaged foods for the most part. Uh, I've been a vegan for forty years, and um, I just eat plants. I you know whole foods. And I never think about whether or not I'm getting enough protein. Um, what does but, a typical meal look like for you? Well, I had kind of an odd breakfast. I mean, oftentimes I'll have like a um, overnight oats with lots of different things in it, chia and hemp and all of that stuff. So all the so-called superfoods. But I'm also Japanese. So this morning I had rice with seaweed and leftover uh, sauteed bitter melon with tofu. So that seems like an odd breakfast, um, but I eat very simply. I eat mainly, um, I eat rice, you know, that's, it's my comfort food. It's what kind of calms me down. Um, I eat a lot of vegetables um, from the garden. Um, I eat legumes, I eat tofu. Um, you know, I try to eat some sort of legume lentils or beans almost every single day. Um, uh, whole grains, although I do eat, um, not white rice. I eat something called haiga rice, which is a partially milled rice. So they leave the germ intact. So it has the nutrients of brown rice, but it doesn't have the whole, just because I like my rice to be light and fluffy. So, um, but so it's a very, I eat a very simple diet for the most part. 
Um, I don't buy a lot of packaged goods. Um, yeah. So tonight, I don't know what I'll eat. I'll have to, it'll, it depends on what I have in the fridge, uh, what I can, what I feel like eating from the garden. Um, I don't have it all planned out. You know, I used to feed a family. I'm a, I'm a, I'm by myself now, uh, all alone. So I only have myself to feed. So my, my your, diet and your, is chickens. And your goats and your goats and chickens. And my goats, <laughs> and my goats and chickens and cows and pigs. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> awesome. And do you take, do you take any supplements, like any supplements that you take? I did start taking vitamin B12, um, but I didn't for the longest time. Um, and then I thought, you know, I don't even know if I really need it, but um, I did so sort of start taking it, I don't know, about a year or so ago. But no, I've never really taken supplements. Um, well, yeah, I just eat. Well, and that's, like, I mean, you, you people eat in the world. I just eat a wide variety of plants. And that's a smart way to do it. And the, you know, and if people are curious, if you're on a vegan diet, it's, you know, get a, get a nutrient panel test, you know, find out like we tested my wife's B12. She doesn't take B12 and hers was through the roof. So I'm like, where are you getting yes. your B12? You know, she's been plant-based diet the same amount of years as I have. So you know, you if, get it from micro or you get it from, from bacteria. Right. And, you know, and I'm, I'm on a farm and, and I've been known to pick up an apple from the ground and eat it. So, yeah. you know, maybe I might be 12 too, but I will tell you that when I was pregnant and nursing my third child, uh, my second child, I, um, uh, was asked to come in for a blood panel to check my iron levels. Cause they were really concerned being yeah. pregnant and nursing same time and my iron level at the time i was probably i was 40 at the time was that of a young man in his early 20s so it was mm. way up there and the 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 dietitian was like what are you eating how are you getting all this <laughs> you're eating you're a lot eating. of beans if you eat beans you, get, you can get iron from beans absolutely that's why a whole food plant-based diet is like you know the on a whole food nutrient-dense diverse plant-based diet you will need the least amount of supplements possible. And for some yes. people, they don't need any supplements. Now, some people they do. Some people can't convert vitamin K1 to K2. You might need to take K2. Some people are not eating seaweed, so they're not getting enough iodine and they're not using iodized salt. So you might need an iodine supplement. But you don't wanna just take iodine and then mess up your thyroid. So test your, test your thyroid levels, test your... Um, test your thyroid hormones, right? You And some people can't convert ALA from vegetables to EPA and DHA for the brain. And EPA and DHA is, is really a conditional nutrient. I mean, it's probably closer to essential nutrient, but not everybody can convert ALA, D, DHA, and EPA. So you might take an algae supplement, right? It's just a few simple things. Vitamin D, if you're not out in the sunshine getting enough vitamin D or you're not getting it from milk or... Um, uh, or eggs. I'm not sure if eggs have vitamin D, but milk does, you know, so if you're vegan, you got to get sunshine. Sunshine is the best form of vitamin D. That Sun, your body oh, sunshine is, is something that everyone needs. So, I mean, absolutely. It impacts, yeah. It impacts our uh, mental health too. I mean, I, it was so gray here for several weeks. I was getting depressed. So I know how it goes. I'm like, man, I'm, I, I'm craving sunshine. I was out there for like 15 minutes. I try to get 15, 20 minutes out in the sunshine every day that I possibly can at minimum. Like I just, I need it. You know, I moved to Florida. I just, it's like, I need that sunshine. I think we all do. <laughs> I know that I feel better and more energy and happier when I have sunshine, but, um, but there's a few ingredients. There's a few nutrients. If you're concerned, you know, people tuning in, do some testing and find out before you start taking a bunch of supplements. I've taken supplements for years and years. And then I test things. I'm like, Oh, I'm either low in this thing, I should take this, or I'm super high in this, I need to stop taking this, you know? Um, and you don't know unless you test, but like yourself, you know, you you uh, obviously look great and are healthy and been doing this a long time and you eat mostly a whole food, plant-based, you know, whole food, real food diet for the most part. And that's why I recommend people 80% plus whole real foods, you know, less as less package as possible. Absolutely. I think that's really the simple answer. and. Most of the world isn't going out and getting, uh, taking supplements and, and testing for their, you know, biomarkers, et cetera. I mean, they're just eating whole foods and that's what they, you know, it, most of the world still eats that way. And we've forgotten how to do that in America. Well, it's been awesome talking with you. Great to meet you. And um, yeah, nice to meet you. You're really brilliant. I, I've, I've, I definitely enjoyed the conversation. 
I had no idea what we were going to talk about. But Me neither. We went down many paths. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I love doing this. I love the podcast. I don't have anything planned. It's just like, just talk and um, see where it goes. And yeah. I, I think uh, I think we did, covered some pretty good ground. So appreciate you coming on. And how can people get in touch with you? Buy your cookbooks. Uh, you got a new. When's your new cookbook coming out? Uh, it's coming out in 2025. You can find my cookbooks on. Well, let's just throw it out there. Amazon or Barnes and Noble or any other bookseller. Uh, just Google my name, Miyoko Shinner. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn, on Instagram, um, uh, working on a website, but it's not up yet. But um, if you just Google me, you'll find me. <laughs> yeah, I follow you on YouTube and Instagram. I love the recipes you've been posting. And uh, Thank you. And yeah, folks, go check out her cookbooks. Got some good ones out there. And um, yeah, thanks again, Miyoko. Appreciate it. All right, Nathan. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye. See ya. Thank you for listening to the Nathan Crane Podcast. Please make sure to subscribe and share this on social media. Then head over to NathanCrane.com for your free ebook. So when we're talking about, you know, what are these underlying causes and conditions of these chronic diseases, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, they all have very similar, if not identical causes. And that's the thing is when we get to the root cause of these diseases, we can not only prevent these diseases from ever happening, but empower our bodies to heal from them. In every one of our cells, we have tens and hundreds of thousands of chemical reactions that are happening every second that are cycling uh, back and forth. It's like sort of a, a yin and yang. And, you know, for me, the soul, soul's purpose is evolution. It doesn't care about comfort. It cares about evolution. Mm. And so I think so long as we are following our soul, then we will evolve. And I think what sometimes blocks us from living our purpose, from manifesting that next level of our expression, is we have not evolved. There is also a time for letting go all the expectations and relax and just breathe and be grateful what, for what you have achieved.